I just kept noticing housing developments that were not fit for purpose, that were bog standard, miserable, awful public space, no green spaces around them. It just looked like house builders had the upper hand and were building awful housing. And there was a lot of criticism about fancy fashion designers, they're only doing it because they're famous. And yet you go back there now and those sketches, the housing is exactly the same and the layouts are exactly the same and the, and the courtyards and everything as those really simple sketches that, that, that Geraldine did, the first ever sketches of housing. Everything works against the consumer in the UK when it comes to housing, everything. And until there's government intervention on that, nothing's going to change. Hello and welcome. This is High Point, the podcast of the acoustic consultancy Atelier Crescendo. At High Point, we talk about performance venues, public places, instruments, acoustics, and music in general. Hi, Wayne. Hi. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me here uh, in your in your office. It's very nice. This episode is not on music or performing arts, uh, so it's a bonus episode. It's going to be more on placemaking and um, how to re regenerate places, uh, public places. So uh, can I ask you to introduce yourself the way you'd like to be introduced? Uh, Wayne Hemingway, from Hemingway, co-founder of Hemingway Design. Um, we're a multidisciplinary design agency. We have a philosophy that design is about improving things that matter in life. We're a B Corp. Um, everything we do, we try to make sure that there's social benefit at the end of it. So you um, started as mainly a designer. Can you tell us a bit, a little bit about that story, how you started? Yeah, so I mean, it started by a completely chance, really. Came to London as an 18-year-old from Lancashire, from um, brought up in Morecambe and Blackburn, two Lancashire towns. And came to London, the main reason was because there was more nightclubs to go to, wanted to form a band, which I did as soon as I ca came to London. What instruments do you play? Uh, I played the saxophone very poorly, okay. um, but I was singer and, and joint songwriter in, in, in the band. But really I came to London because I'd grown up from the age of 13 going out nightclubbing, fashion was really important wearing second-hand clothes from a single-parent family, working-class background. And you know, the main thing in my life was going to watch bands and going dancing and buying records. And you can do more of that in London from, than where I was from. And that was the reason I came to London. So you started the band called... Uh, the, the, band, the band was called Diverse. And, yeah. um, It, uh, it was 1979 when I moved to London. I think I formed a band in the first year and then there was a second iteration of the band in 1980. I met Geraldine, who um, mm -hmm. was then, you know... Your wife. Yeah. Now my wife, yeah. Mm -hmm. She came to live in London probably in about 1980 or 80, 81, I think she came, to, she came to live in London. And famously, we emptied our wardrobes onto Camden Market um, The rent was six quid. We took 300 quid that weekend selling a combination of secondhand clothes that, and my old punk clothes. And, and Geraldine's, Geraldine had always made clothes for herself and her sisters. She'd left school at 15 with no qualifications. Very similar, really. She left school to earn money. She was a wages clerk. She wanted to earn money so she could buy fabric to make clothes to go out and, uh, and go dancing. She moved to London emptied our wardrobes and the kind of the rest is history we we ended up selling became the biggest seller of secondhand clothes it was now now you call it vintage clothing on an industrial scale in Camden Kensington uh, Manchester parallel to that we started a label called Red or Dead and that was again by chance Geraldine took a stall in Kensington Market It was 10 quid a week didn't even put a label in her clothing didn't have a name for the brand and she made eight, eight items of clothing which got spotted by Macy's New York who were who were over in London for London Fashion Week. We'd, obviously we'd, we'd had never heard of London Fashion Week and she took an order for uh, a, a, pre a pretty big order really from Macy's New York. They were over in uh, in London for London Fashion Week which we hadn't heard of. They must have walked up uh, Kensington High Street from Olympia. Geraldine took this decent size order. My mum left her job She was working behind the bar of a, a pub called The Halfway House, halfway between Blackman and Preston. One of Geraldine's sisters, who could also sew, left 
uh, her job working for Riley's snooker tables in Accrington. My mum employed a few more people. We She used our Camden second-hand money, second-hand clothing sales money to um, to buy a load of second-hand ma- sewing machines, set up a factory in Rowley Mills in Blackburn. Cut a long story short, we came up with the label Red or Dead, um, which was a reference to kind of some some political beliefs we had and um, still have actually. And also the fact that my uh, father was, he died last summer, was a, in old money, well, I suppose I have to say First Nation, but um, I can probably guess that most people on here, although they can research it, Canadian First Nation, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Obviously I've listened to quite a few podcasts with you and um, it was quite interesting that you seem to be the first people to do second-hand clothes, which a lot of people do now. It's mainly for financial reasons that they do it, but also for sustainable reasons as well. What's your position on this? Do you try to carry on or encourage this? Yeah, well, so when we did it, it wasn't for sustainability back in, you know, when I grew up. So I started wearing second-hand clothes in, would have been 1974, and it was, I'd seen David Bowie on stage in Blackburn and couldn't get his clothes and just learned how to do it from army surplus shops and, and, sec- and second-hand shops. Wasn't the, I wasn't the first person to do it because people had been wearing second-hand clothes. It was quite a big thing in the, the end of the late 60s and the beginning of the 70s, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't... F- I was fairly close to, to the, the first... I was kind of in the first wave of people wearing second-hand clothes as a, as a fashion statement. It was a fashion statement, but it was also a necessity. I would never have been able to... If, if you were brought up in a town like Morecambe or Blackburn, there were no fashion shops as such. There was one in Blackburn called Clobber, but you wouldn't have been able to afford to keep buying from that. And, and everybody else who was going out would have bought from that same shop. And if you want to be different, you don't do that. So I learned how to customise clothes, how to, to wear secondhand and, and, and that. At Camden, we probably weren't the first selling second-hand clothes, and my guess is that there would have been others, but we certainly became the main. We, we certainly kind of took it on and on a on a large scale, and that's a funny story as well. It's that's partly to do with my nan, who we cleared her wardrobe out and my mum's wardrobe out of all of their 1950s and 60s clothing, and then she found from a rag and bone man. That's another one for the listeners to look up what a rag and bone man is where the rags went, the clothing went, and they went to all of these um, Mungo and Shoddy yards. That's where the word shoddy clothing comes from, which were basically recycling yards in the north, in a town called Dewsbury. And we, we used to go there every single week with a blooming big lorry and fill it with uh, vintage, as we didn't have that word vintage then, as cool second-hand clothing, which all these women would, would sort for us and, and, and then we'd pay them more and we'd pay the, the, the rag yard owner more than he would get from sending it to landfill or to, or, or to wiping rags. A lot of clothing then was used to wipe up the oil that came out of when engines were changed on cars. There's, there's a whole history of it, really interesting history of the, the history of recycled clothing. But nowadays... And, and I've always worn secondhand clothes to this, mostly to this day. And like even my grandkids, my kids are bringing up the grandkids to wear, and and I only have secondhand and only have secondhand toys. And we've just always been that way. But it started off definitely from the point of view of thrift and being different. And then now, obviously, we all know that it's got a, a, a more important thing than that. Well, thrift is still very important for a lot of people, obviously. But the most important thing is obviously climate. If you wear secondhand, if you buy secondhand toys, if you don't keep making new, then you're contributing as positively as possible to that. Mm-hmm. And also, you're you're also kind of not dealing in fast fashion and fast products and all the other issues in terms of exploitation that can go with that. Yeah. No, it's yeah, I agree. Obviously, I, I don't buy all my clothes secondhand, but we've definitely started to do it more and more. Um, well, I'm definitely 100% in, yeah. in secondhand. Not not my running shoes though, because that's a, although I've just bought I've just bought on eBay some secondhand running shoes this week to see. I'm not sure about yeah, it's, that. It's it's surprising how much you can find like absolutely brand new. Of people who don't want, and they've worn it once. So, yeah. so I bought some. My first time I've ever bought secondhand running shoes. They're, they should be arriving very soon. Right. So I'm gonna, <laughs> that's the first time I've ever tried that. I'm slightly we'll nervous about that. Yeah, we, we, um, it's a big deal for it at the moment with kids. Oh, because, the office yeah. dog is is giving a bit of jip. Yeah, <laughs> or one of the office dogs. One? Um, how many? Uh, well, mine's that's my 
eldest daughter is a partner in a company. That's her dog, Mo. And then we've got my dog, Minnie, but she's a bit old to come to the office at the moment. She's, she's getting on a bit, sadly. <laughs> yeah. It's a big thing, especially for, for... A lot of people say kids are very no, not sustainable because they consume a lot of things. You buy a lot of things brand new. and um, we. You just don't need to, though. Yeah. You, you actually don't need to. I'm pretty sure that Tilly has hardly bought anything for her kids that's that's new and we mm. we certainly don't and jack similar um you know my eldest son you, you can you can actually do it now charity shops are absolutely full oh, of yeah. amazing yeah. kids clothes i, I completely but, agree with that and yeah. and toys if if as long as you keep going in you know you're going to find stuff all the time yeah yeah um and it's it's kind of um bit of a pleasure you'd never know what you're going to be able to find well i mean find some random toys you'd never thought about well the funny thing was is that we've got this thing now that i'm co-founder with maria chenoweth who's um ceo of the charity trade we set up this thing called charity supermarket which is absolutely flying at the moment and amazing and it's really funny we were talking to some people recently about who are avid charity shoppers and they're saying that when they go into a shop selling new things, it kind of disorientates them because they've got all of this clothing, multiples of the same thing in all different sizes. But when you go into a charity shop, it's like, oh, it's all exciting because you never see two things the same. And so for some people, that idea of there's only one way of shopping and it's it's that kind of the thrill of the chase, like you just said, you don't know what you're going to get. Exactly. Also recently renovated a kitchen and we realised that there's so many kitchens that are um, sold secondhand mm. because people move in the houses, they yeah, don't yeah. want a kitchen or they want to an extension. And there's amazing kitchens that are less than five years old that can be reused and reassembled. And I guess maybe people don't know you can do that, but it's incredible how much you can save in terms of carbon emissions and obviously money. Uh, yeah, yeah I, th- I think it's just also, the only thing about it all is sometimes it can take more time but that, if you turn that time into fun, it's mm. it's not it's not drudgery. It's there is fun in saving money. I've I've always enjoyed fun in saving money, and you yeah. know, I always think my money can be better spent on something else than than just buying something new when you can do it secondhand. And now, when you add on top of that that feel good factor that you're doing the right thing, which again I must stress, I didn't know I was doing the right thing in the past. Yeah. You know, it really for young people it must feel weird to think that. You know, this has been going on for a while, but we didn't know why we would. We did. We, we, the main reason now for doing this is surely about climate mm-hmm. change, but back then it just wasn't. There was no mention of it. We were doing it for other reasons, but those other reasons are, are still valid. Something I did not and I noticed and discovered is that you designed the uniforms of Transport for London. Yeah, yeah. And uh, very Virgin proud of trains. that project. Yeah, really proud of it. Um, that was, well, number one, the feel-good factor of going, you know, use the tubes many times a week and to go down there and see all those people wearing the uniform. And now we're, we're nearly 10 years on from when it was designed and for it still to look as good and still to be worn with pride. And that's a long time for a, a product to last as well and not, and not be updated. But it's also the process of how we got there. This, with all of these things you have to bid, this is you know public sector work and you have to bid against many other bidders who would have bid for that. We bid because we, we had an idea to do the, the largest ever co-design project that London Transport had ever done, but also that had been done in a uniform. And we basically designed that uniform with 16,000 of the 22,000 wearers, the TFL cohort played a role in that. And we were so open, we'd have webinars where we were designing and showing everything and people were they had our email addresses to email and it was a really they're unionized so they had a lot to say they had a lot to say about this but I'm so proud of the fact that we created a uniform that 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 belongs to them we learned a lot through that project and it made us realize that co-design is a great thing to do and right now we're do, we're co-designing the girl guides uniform with um, with the girl guides with 330 350,000 girl guides we're just starting on that now. So let's go to placemaking. Um, when did you start working on this? Because switching from going from clothes to buildings and areas is, or urban design. Yeah, we never we we'd never How? planned we'd never planned this at all. And like like most things have, we've done in our life, we've never planned it. And this was a case of just sold red or dead. So 
1998, 1999. And I just kept noticing housing developments that were not fit for purpose, that were bog standard, miserable, awful public space, no green spaces around them. It just looked like, you know, there's been a housing shortage. It's not just now that there's a housing shortage. There's been a housing shortage for a long time. And, and it just felt like house builders had the upper hand and were building awful housing. And then I read an article in the Sunday Times written by Jeremy Clarkson, who I kind of not, don't like at all, many reasons not to like him, including I've met him and I really disliked him when I met him, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he wrote this article about this housing development just outside Cambridge that he said that he liked and he and he would live in and uh, you know he was kind of saying well all modern housing isn't isn't bad this is good housing so i thought i've got to go and see this you know i've got to go and see why he's saying it it's so good and so um went there and it was awful everything it was like a semi gated community cold and soulless car dominated Everything was everything was about the car, and nothing was about people and and getting out on the streets and saying hello. To, it just seemed like you just drive up to your front door. Still very much, much very much the case at the moment. Yeah, oh, put your key in the lock. All the housing looking the same, kind of faux, mm. faux design, you know. And I wrote an article in the Independent about why I'd been to visit the place and then came up with the phrase the wimpification and the baratification of Britain, which at the time, it must it just resonated. I don't know. It was just, I didn't tr try to create a, words that would resonate. But very quickly it got, it went viral before there was, you know, not, not viral internet type thing because there wasn't really, that was only the start of, there wasn't social, I doubt if there was any social media in 1999, whenever this was, 2000. But anyway, viral by getting me on telly. So I was invited onto Newsnight and in a debate with the house builders, Pax, Jeremy Paxman, who was the presenter, sided with me. And to cut a long story short, the, the daughters of the chair of Wimpy Homes, as they were called then, suggest, who, who were big Red or Dead fans, suggested that he should speak to Geraldine and myself. He told us that they would never buy housing from him from Wimpy but they but if the Hemingways had designed them then they know that they would be focused on 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 people and have the right values and he listened to his daughters and um so that way it's come from because yeah I read that an article on the BBC explaining all that story yeah and I I, I didn't have the the, the gap bridging story when who well or people who were his daughters. Yeah, so that's that's where it came from. So it was a Red or Dead link. Because so we'd always been at Red or Dead. We'd always had, it was a values-led, you know, our catwalk shows always had a, a message, whether it was anti-nuclear, whether, whether it was pro-Greenpeace, you know, all, mm -hmm. all of those kind of things, there was a message, and they must have been following that. And so, Anyway, so the funny story about it is that we went up to see this site, this former Queen's... Garden Park site where, she, where where there was some celebration of her of one of her anniversaries, and um, I remember Wimpy saying, "Would you like to design some homes on here?" And we we both thought it was um, just some show homes or something. So mm -hmm. we asked how many, and and they said, "Oh well, it it'll fit about 760 homes on here." And I said, "Are you asking us to design the whole lot?" because we've never designed any homes before. And they said, yeah, would, would you be interested? And Geraldine just said, yes. Whoa. I just thought, Whoa. looked at her and just thought, what the hell? So it was interior design? No. Aesthetic was, design? Everything. No, architectural design as well? It was the master plan. Okay. The, the layout, the philosophy, the philosophy, the values of the development. Mm -hmm. We knew we had to get help. Obviously, we're not architects. Um, never claimed to be architects and were certainly not going to suddenly go and study and become architects. So we found a like-minded couple, Jane and Mark Massey, from a company called IDP Partnership, who we made a brilliant relationship with, and, and a, set of other, a set of other specialists, landscape architects, um, engineers. We just seemed to be able to f put a dream team together, and we delivered it. And it's, without doubt, still the highlights of, I think the highlights of both our careers 
um, in terms of when I go back there, I, I can't believe how good it is. It, and the community are always contacting us. You know, it's thousands of people live there and it looks great. It's matured great. It, it's still got, from what I can see, the highest mark ever that Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment gave for a, a, a housing development outside of the southeast of England. We did things so differently there to do with the car, to do with public space, to do with the streets, to do with how it was marketed and who it was marketed to. And it was a, a fractious relationship with many aspects of Wimpy at the time, but we always had the ear and the trust from the very top, from the, the chairman via his daughters. And in, in the end, it worked out fantastic. And yeah, um, we, we had a great time because we, we had to learn very quickly and so we, we toured the world looking at housing developments that we'd read about. It was just constant studying and finding out the, the ones that were getting talked about the best. We, we travelled out, you know, extensively through Scandinavia, Germany, France, uh, North, Northern, North America, even Australia, we were looking at, we were looking at housing developments. And we, we took the kids just out of school, sometimes in trouble with social, um, social services, it was just a brilliant time of learning and doing something. And we took so much inspiration from Denmark, Holland and Sweden, really. Mm. But the amazing thing is now is that they, they have tours from those countries back to the States to look at it. Oh, really? You know, <laughs> we've actually done, you know, we've actually taken some of their principles and maybe, you know, done it on, a, on, on, quite, on quite a large... And it just works so well. It's just... So why... When was this? So this started uh, the first... The first phase, so people started moving in in 2003, so it will have been two and a half years before that when we started to design it. And the funny thing is, is that Geraldine's first sketches got into The Guardian at the time, and there was a lot of criticism, so much criticism about how how could fashion fancy fashion designers, they're only doing it because they're famous, that how could fashion designers, and yet you go back there now and those sketches the housing is exactly the same and the layouts are exactly the same and the, and the courtyards and everything as those really simple sketches that, that, that Geraldine did, the first ever sketches of housing. So the industry doesn't seem to have followed suit with that because if it's a massive success, although you have to measure the success, it's, did that bring a lot of money? Did that uh, have a lot of benefits and therefore values? Presumably, yes. Why are the developers still doing the same thing? Because right. we, so, we went through a like, horrible experience. We hear about loads of horrible experiences and it, it's just, it doesn't change. And it seems to be very particular to the UK. Um, I, I Obviously, I'm, I'm French and we, um, we don't really hear about that happening so often. And I work with uh, a few Scandinavian companies as well. And the, the standards of building houses is so much higher. So, so why does why it, why does it happen? Well, num number one, quite a lot of developments like the States have happened and things have improved, but it's still a long, long way from being, from being wh where it should be and, and why. And ultimately, I think it's because we can be quite a greedy nation. Land values here are crazy. Ultimately, everything is down to land value. So, for example, you can get... So if, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have some farmland and it's on the edge of a town or a city and that town or city needs houses, which most towns or cities do, and you get it designated as the possibility of it being for housing, you can get an uplift, depending on which part of the country, up to 200 times the value of that land compared to what it's worth as arable or grazing, grazing land, what it's worth as farmland. Most human beings take that money. And there is nothing in this country to stop somebody making that amount of money. Mm. Whereas in Holland, they've been testing all sorts of things like maximum of 25 times increases. In France, I think last time I read it was about the maximum you ever get is around 40. So what you get in the UK is absolutely a crazy situation of, maybe because we're a small, tight country, but, but Holland is much more tight and, and less space. The Netherlands is, I mean. And, and so, number one, there's that greed of land prices. And then, once a house builder has paid that amount of money, it leaves very little else to do anything any good. Now, I'm not going to let the house builders off at all because they don't work as hard, a lot of them don't work as hard as they could to give 
public value. They've paid a fortune, right, and that's usually come from pension funds and investment, so, and their job is to protect that investment, well, to make that investment, and that's a greedy industry as well. You know, we expect big returns on, on your money if you, if you invest it. And then the house builders, the big ones, Persimmon, Bellway, Wimpy, get a 20% return on investment, 20% ROCE. Now, that means for every £100 they spend, they expect to make £20 profit. If you get to 10% in most businesses, you, you, you can be very, very happy. That's 20% after all wages, after, after all bonuses, all, all of that kind of stuff. The question is, does it need to be, you know, number one, does the land need to be that expensive and people make that much profit on the land? And number two, then do the builders need to make 20%? All of that does either two things. It either pushes prices up or it makes you strip the quality out. It's only, it's only two ways. And then there is also a, a semi-monopoly situation. There aren't that many house builders in the UK, whereas in Europe there are a lot of smaller house builders who are competing with each other and the government doesn't hand out 800 homes like it did to one developer. And, and when you've got a, a, de a development of 800, 1,000 homes, you've got no real competition because that might be the only homes that are being built in that part of town. And some people only want to live in that part of town to be near family and schools and hospitals and, and all of that. So everything works, against, everything works against the consumer in the UK when it comes to housing, everything. And until there's government intervention on that, nothing's going to change. There's still, um, I, I completely agree with that, although there's still a few developers or developing companies who are starting to change things, but... They're small, um, though. They're, yeah, they're yeah, small. They're uh, small, and, they're, and it's I, great I that it's happening, them, yeah. but, but, the, but, you know... And it's usually for high-end yeah, houses. What we need is more affordable housing. Just um, general middle-of-the-road pricing housing should be way better than it is in the UK, and that's what we tried to do. But if we have to be honest, we only achieved it. Low land value. This was, this was land that, was, that had been left empty for 15 years in what the council called a donut of deprivation, which is basically surrounded on three sides by very low-value land. And so it was in the lowest-value land in the whole of that conurbation, just about. So that means that helped as to spend more money on design and landscape. And, second, and secondly, we're in an unusual situation with the CEO of a, of a, of a house builder who wanted... The one thing I did miss out, this was his hometown. Uh, so Gateshead was his hometown, uh, his birth town. So yeah. he wanted to also leave a legacy. So we were in a very lucky situation. Yeah. You know, the chairman of a, of a company wanting to leave a legacy on really low land values at the right time, right place. And have you done that again? Yeah, that yeah, we've done work? a number of... Uh, we did one in Dartford. We've done one in Blackburn in the town I was brought up in. Not as affordable as, as the Gateshead, the Staiths in Gateshead. We've done um, social housing uh, in Kings Lynn, in Maidenhead. Um, yeah. Are you going to do anything around Manchester? We've done a, we did a small one in Manchester called the Birchin. That's quite a long time ago now, but... We would like to do more housing. That's up to the next... I always say to the, that's the next generations. To When they've done a housing development better than the States, and then we've moved on, we've moved on another level. So let's um, speak about more placemaking now. Um, by the way, um, are you involved in uh, anything around Stratford uh, at the moment? Not, not at the moment in Stratford, no. The, um, yeah, that's the main reason why I contacted you, uh, because I heard about you. Stratford or Stratford? Uh, Stratford. Manchester. In, in Manchester, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I thought... Well, we're, was... working, we're working across... We're literally working next to Stratford in Media City, okay. which is Salford, which is yeah. literally 100 metres across the bridge mm -hmm. from Stratford. Well, let's talk about this then. Um, what exactly did you do? Because all right, my experience with the Media City is that is, it's nice. And the first time we arrived in Manchester was about nine or ten years ago. We thought the Media City was really cool. But then I ended up working two years there at the Media City and I, it, was, it was quite soreless to, so that's to why, stay there. So in, we were lucky enough to be asked for exactly those reasons. It was coming up to the 10th anniversary of the BBC moving in and it felt a bit, a bit soulless. So the first thing that we did there, like we do in a lot of places, is work on a, on a place, what's called a place brand. So a set of values 
for, for what a place could be. And we worked with a, a local, there was two, two of us, a company called Modern Designers and ourselves, we worked, we worked together on it. And we came up with a set of values of which um, Media City could have. And it was, one of them was about it being, to put it, there's a whole list of wording mm-hmm. around this, but to cut, to cut it short, it was for it to be a place that was more people friendly yeah. and, and less about open spaces and just offices and, yeah. and, and a place. It's exactly what it was. Yeah, exactly. So people can hang out there and feel comfortable and things were happening. We had this kind of phrase for it to always be always on so that whenever you go there as a human being, there'd be things to, to do and, and see and take part in. The first thing that we did is this thing called Box on the Docks, um, which was a very simple thing during COVID, to help out with all the restaurants that were, to give them, we, t- we bought sheds and greenhouses, just typical bog standard cheap ones from like B&Q, and worked with local artists who were all, if you remember, artists didn't get any support in, in COVID. So, Can you mention a few of them? They, well, is, it, was a, it was the Islington Mill cohort. So there's a, um, Islington Mill is a, a brilliant setup in, in, uh, in, in Salford. And we, we went there and, and there was about 12 artists that we got to do something on, uh, to customise these, these sheds and things. And that was so that they would up to, do you remember, I think it was groups of six people could eat together as long yeah. as they were away from other, other people and it had to be outside. So these were outside the restaurants, in the public realm. And it just looked so good. It looked, it added that homemade, that gritty element to all those glassy blocks and the BBC and everything. And then it brought the artists from the mills, from Islington Mill, which is, there's a big difference between how that area of Salford feels and how Media City feels. And it always felt like never the twain shall come together. That brought that together. The people who, who were working there loved it. People from outside Salford loved it. And then we realised, OK, if we do things that are, that are kind of more gritty, it, it, can, ch- it can start to change this place. So, so the, ne- the next thing was, was we, we were great believers in if you create a big event, an annual event or something like that, and, it's like, oh, and you invite thousands of people to come and experience a place mm-hmm. and, and you just fill it with ideas and things, some of those ideas stick all year round. And we've done that very successfully with, we were the co-founders of the Festi- National Festival of Making in Blackburn, the mm-hmm. Festival of Thrift up on Teesside, Vintage by the Sea in Morecambe, First Light in Lowestoft, Classic Car Boot Sale. All of these are either a combination of ones that we are sit on the, the community interest company boards or we own some of them and, and own the brands and run them ourselves. A whole series of, of those things that we do as part of the events and placemaking team here. So we'd got the experience of that. And, and, and we, so we got a lot of brains together, some from the BBC, some from the Salford Uni, some from the Lowry, and all the partners of Media City and said, what could we do here that could be an annual event that belong, that could only take place? Because a lot of our events, maybe we get the chance to talk about them after, could only take place in the, in the place that they happen in because the, the, the kind of DNA of that place only allows would only allow that. They, don't, they can't go anywhere else. And we thought, could we do something that could only take place? Because it had never had an event that really, really resonated with the Salford community, with the BBC incoming community, with, with Stretford across the water. It, ne- didn't, it never had that. It never had something that the whole of the conurbation of, of Greater Manchester and wider and, and the region would ever really want to come all at one time. And that's a big ask. But something amazing happened in a meeting. There was somebody from the BBC who said, I was watching Who Do You Think You Are, which is that programme where they trace the lineage of people. And mm-hmm. Sir Ian McKellen, um, you know, the famous British actor, had said that his great-grandfather had worked and was from Salford or had worked in Salford and that he campaigned for the rights for people to have Saturdays and the weekend off, and, 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 he, and he was the first in the world to, to arrange for people to have Saturday off. So basically the weekend started here. And I said, is this right? I said, so the, inve- the weekend was invented here. And we got on the internet and we found out this guy called Robert Lowe's in 1843, sure enough, campaigned for workers' rights in the, in the textile mills of, of Salford, and the reason why football kicks off at Saturday afternoon is because that's when, for the first time at three o'clock, traditionally, because that was because that was the first time that anybody had ever had Saturday workers had ever had Saturday afternoon. Oh. And we're looking at this and saying, if this 
really is the place that invented the weekend. The value in that is crazy. So we, we kept researching. We, the next thing we could find was Henry Ford, five years later in Chicago, had, had, had done the same thing. And so we got Salford University, some scholars there to start to, and historians to check because we, I just knew we were onto something amazing, but you can't just assume it. Mm. And lo and behold, we got all the proof we needed. That place owns the weekend. So we came up with We Invented the Weekend and a festival and a festival that was all about the joys. You know, every, unless you're working all weekend, you look forward to the weekend. You know, even if you're on a business, you can't wait till those emails stop coming in at around six o'clock or mainly stop coming. Although they're done sometimes. Yeah, but but the the, the volumes go yeah, massively yeah. down at six o'clock on a Friday, a bit earlier than that nowadays. And so we thought, right, we're, we're going to own the weekend. We're going to create a festival called We Invented the Weekend and it's happening and it's happened and it's happening. It's, it will always happen now because it's such a good subject matter. Mm-hmm. And it's basically a festival, I think 60,000 people turned up at the first one, uh, where you can experience what people do at a weekend and try things yourself and show off what you do at a weekend. And the breadth of it is absolutely it's massive. It's just, it's everything we do with, we call it the, the festival. It's, we invented the weekend, the festival of free time. And it's just what you do in your free time, as long as it's legal. It's make me, making me want to, to go back there because we haven't been uh, at the media city for ages. Well, it's yeah. changing, you know, and, and we at it's, the moment, even Quayside shopping centres changing, you know, um, charity supermarkets in there. There's a great food hall in there. Young Is there people, a food hall? Yeah, great food hall in Quayside now. Yeah. And and it's um, and young people are moving in there. There's, and it's just fi- it's starting to feel a very different place than mm. than when we started working there in 2016, I think it was, or 2017. It's, it feels a very different place now. Cool. And that's what place making is. It's about people doing stuff and enjoying a place. So um, obviously we've got a few uh, minutes left, but um, my main question to you is: How do we regenerate a place? What are the key aspects to make it successful well i think you have to get under the skin of what a place is and what a people what people want it to be mm-hmm. you know we invented the weekend wouldn't have wouldn't have been successful just on an idea we had to then go out and test it on the community of salford and they just came forward people who had judo clubs wanted to bring their mats out on that weekend people who taught dance lessons wanted to come out people who just simple things like you want to things like dance with your mother which was a a, a, mum, a mother and babies group who meet every week and babies in slings and they all dance to house music on a on a saturday morning in a church hall well all of that came out and they all wanted to come out and show what they did so you've got to do things that 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 resonate and the reason why the Festival of Making in Blackburn, the National Festival of Making, is so popular, because Blackburn is a making town. It's got the highest proportion of people who go to work and make things in any other town in the country. It's in, it's in the, the blood of... And, and the great thing is it's, it's in the blood of, of, of the incoming generation, the, mi- the migrants that came you know, from Pakistan and, and Bangladesh and, and who, who came to Blackburn to make things when they first came in the... 70s, I think, early 70s, the major. But now they're a community that are making paper in the paper mills, making this, make, making car parts, making that. Uh, and, and so it, it is a making town, and that's helped to bring communities together as well. And that's, that's what placemaking is about, finding out what a town or a place is about and then getting the people to rally around that. The first time I heard about you was through Sophie Gibson, who's the chair the, uh, of Burnley, Burnley, Burnley Empire, Empire yeah. Um, yeah. I know you support them. Um, can, you, can you tell us a bit more about how you support them and why? Well, I think the main reason I support them cause, was because of Sophie. Um, she came to us as a, a young... A, might have even still been a teenager. I'm pretty sure she was still, still studying. I don't, I can't, and it was a long time ago. She, and she came um, to us because... It is a heritage building, um, an entertainment building in a town that's struggling. Um, and Geraldine is from Padium, which is, you know, Burnley postcode. And she came to us and said, could you help? You know, you've got profile, you've got experience in doing this. And so we we gave her as much support as, as we had the as time to do. I mean, it's a really tough project, that one. I've seen your podcast about, yeah. about it, which is I think great. it's episode 10 or 11. It's yeah, great. and it's... We've worked on a lot of, you know, the Winter Gardens in Morecambe, the Harris in Preston. We've worked on a lot of 
and the, the Guild Hall in, in, in uh, Portsmouth we're, work, we're working on now and the Market Hall in Penzance. We're working on a lot of these things and we, and, and we have worked on a lot. The Burnley Empire is probably the toughest. A number of reasons. It needs... <laughs> A lot of work. It's you know, it's, it's absolutely trashed inside it, and outside. Yeah. If you see the pictures of the, the the historic pictures, it's changed so much. And I was asking Sophie, why has it changed so much? Why is it so trashed? Yeah. It's been trashed. It's an amazing building that's been trashed, but it still has some intrinsic, lots of intrinsic beauty within it. And Burnley needs the Burnley Empire. Towns like Burnley need need those venues. They need to respect that history, but they also need to bring it back. They need to bring those buildings back for for young people to do what young people do, which is you know create music, create mm. theatre, uh, create culture. It has to come back as a cultural venue. The, the thing is, we will never build venues as good as that again, f for many reasons, and, and some of them the wrong reasons. You know, the cost of labour was, you know, and it wasn't slave labour back then, but it, but it was people weren't paid a lot. But we've also lost the skills to do that kind of stuff. So to be able to bring that back and, and link the history with, with today is really important. But And Sophie's been just just brilliant, but still... There's years and years and years to go, and I, I hope she can keep her energy up and the people around her can keep the energy up. Yeah, because they're really long projects and people don't want to you know, properly invest in them until they've got proof that it, yeah. will, it will make and it will be successful. So, uh, so yeah, let's hope yeah. it will be in a few years, as fast as possible. Um, you mentioned the Portsmouth Good Hold, because I was quite interested about the... Uh, performance vet, uh, space there can you explain what you did yeah well we're working on that now that's a, okay. a, a Portsmouth Guildhall as and when they get money turning it from a it's it's right in the centre of Portsmouth it's it's the cultural institution and building they've got a lovely team there like everything there isn't the money like there was um and when, when we did Dreamland in Margate there was a lot more money around, you know, that, I think we got 18 million. And, and there isn't that kind of money around anymore to spend on, on cultural institutions. So we're doing bits at a time on the Portsmouth Guildhall, but it is the, the cultural beating heart of, of the city. How about the Festival of, um, yeah, Festival of Love in South Bank Centre? Um, well, that was a long time ago, yeah. yeah. I thought, I can't remember the, the name of the act to that the Festival of Love was uh, celebrating is basically um, people of the same sex can be married. I thought it was quite interesting because, in I don't know if you knew, but in the law, the act was passed at roughly the same time as in France. Didn't hear about any demonstrations in the UK about this. There were so many people demonstrating against it which I think is crazy, the difference in, in approach. Or maybe there was a lot of people who weren't happy but didn't say anything. I mean, the Festival of Love was a... That was a very exciting time at the South Bank. That wasn't... We did festivals that were just purely from us at the, at the South Bank, but this one wasn't. We just played a role in, in that one. But South Bank was hit very, very hard by... A lot, a lot of cultural institutions were hit very, very hard by COVID and then, you know, they lost so many staff and and some of them work here now. So it's been hard for a lot of them to get back on their feet. And, you know, the South Bank is... I think it's my favourite building in London is the Royal Festival Hall. It's just amazing. And, we, you know, for years we did this thing called a Vintage New Year's Eve there, which been very. this is the first year we haven't done it in, I don't know, eight or nine years, apart from COVID years. But they've, they've really struggled to get back to where they were. So we'd love to work with them again and, and help, help get the South Bank back on its... more back on its feet than it's... You know, back to its glory days, which I don't think it's quite there yet. Well, thank you very much. All right, well, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah, it's time, but... Um, yeah, that goes, yeah, quick, goes nice. quickly, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have one last question? How do you do we get in touch with you? And do you have any a guest to suggest for the podcast? So get in touch with me, first of all, or get yes, in touch with Hemingway uh, Design. Hemingway is, Design. It's just uh, info mm, at Hemingway fully, Design. Okay. Info at Hemingway Design, 1M in Hemingway. Guests for the programme, well... I'm really interested in this thing called the Museum of, uh, of, of Youth Culture at the moment. Um, and John, the co-founder the co co of that, who also co-founded an amazing magazine called Sleaze Nation, I would really consider you speaking to okay. the Museum of Youth Culture. Great. I will uh, do that if you give me, uh, introduce me. Yeah, just email. I'll introduce, just do it by email. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cheers, right. man. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And if you enjoyed it, don't forget to like, share and subscribe.